Sow the seed of God's word and not some back alley false wisdom. Not your own opinion. Not some stuff you heard your grandfather say that's going to sound good at the time. If you go sow a seed, sow his word. Sow the word of God. Everyone turn your Bibles to uh, the book of Luke, chapter 8. We'll get into the word. Luke, chapter 8. And as you turn, I just want to give honor to God as we just prayed. And uh, just so grateful and, and, and thankful for all the man, great things that he's doing in my life. But even as I look upon my brothers and sisters, all that he's doing in your life, uh, I'm grateful. Uh, even though it may not be, you know, he's, him blessing me, I'm encouraged by him blessing others. Also want to give, pa give Pastor Omar some, some honor. I want to give him a hand. And uh, I know we just pray, but I, when I get up here, I'm always feeling led to pray for him. Um, you know, just with him doing so much and traveling and, and just, you know, being overseer of three campuses and the spiritual leader, you know, spiritual overseer uh, of three campuses, that under shepherd of not just one Philly, but three Phillies. So we just want to extend our hands real quick. We'll do a, a few, um, do a good bit of praying before we get started in the word. But Father, we just thank you for Pastor. Pastor, oh Lord God, just want to give you praise for the work that you're doing, Lord God, through him. Uh, we pray, we thank you, Lord God, that even uh, in this place tonight, Lord God, that this is the work, Lord God, that you've established his hands to do, Lord God. You've worked through him for us to be here tonight, Father, and we thank you for that, God. We honor you for that, God, and we acknowledge that you've used him, God. Continue to use him and protect him, not only him, but his wife, Lord God, first lady and his children, God. Keep them, lead them, and guide them in all things, Father. What I pray for my own family, I pray upon them, Lord God. Protect them in all things, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Luke chapter 8. Maybe I should use my tab. All right. Um, today I've uh, spent a lot of time preparing for the word, but also praying for my godson, y'all. Uh, my godson's name is Leo. His dad is uh, my best friend. And uh, we've been friends since the third grade, Jeremy. So Leo actually had um, a little surgery today. Uh, he has a very rare condition that kind of hinders his breathing. So he was in, in Houston today having a, uh, like a two hour procedure. Um, so as I was praying for him, uh, I felt led and, and wanted to involve you guys. We're gonna pray for him. But as we pray for him, I'm gonna ask everybody to ex extend one hand toward the screen. We're gonna pray for Leo for his recovery. His surgery went extremely well. Um, but also with your other hand, go ahead and place that hand upon yourself. Because as we pray for him, we're gonna pray for ourselves. There are others, in, some of us in here need a healing tonight. Some of us in here tonight need some, some prayer for healing, right, and restoration. And even if you may not be in need of a healing, maybe you know somebody. Maybe you can stand in the gap for somebody who's in need of healing. We all know at least two to three people who need Hallelujah. some healing, right, who need God to touch them. Yes. So go ahead and stretch forward your hand toward the screen. We're going to pray for Leo. We're going to pray for our family. We're going to pray for ourselves. One hand upon yourself again, maybe praying for yourself or standing in the gap someone you know. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, God. Your word tells us that healing is the children's bread, God. And God, we're here tonight, some of us, God, we're hungry. We're in need of that bread, God. And we know, Lord God, that you're a good father. And anything, Lord God, that we need, you will not withhold from us, Father. So we pray tonight for Leo. Yes, we pray, Lord God, for my brothers and sisters here tonight, Lord God those who they may be representing and standing in the gap for, Lord God, asking that you would heal bodies, Lord God, that you would regulate blood pressure, Father, that you would regulate, Lord God, uh, uh, blood glucose levels in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would re restore mindsets, Lord God, some dealing with issues in, in the mind, Lord God, anxiety as though it were, Lord God. I'm praying, Father, that you would heal cancer, Lord God. We know that you can do it right now, Father, and we expect nothing less, Father, because of your power, God, your wonder-working power, Father. Some of us here, Lord God, some of us not here, but Father, we know that even if they're not here by faith, you can heal them, God, in the name of Jesus. Praying that you would restore bodies, Lord God, that you would, Lord God, uh, uh, cast out arthritis in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Aches and pains in the name of Jesus, Father, be gone right now in the name of Jesus. Restoration right now, Lord God, upon your people, Father. Your people, God, 
We're just asking, Lord God, for what you promised, God. We thank you for that promise. We expect, Lord God, for you to make true on that promise, God. Not in a prideful way, Lord God, but in a Christ-confident way. Heal your people, God. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. All right. Awesome, awesome. Thank y'all for that. Thank y'all. Luke chapter 8, verse 4, we're going to begin. That's what we're going to be coming out of. And uh, as I was studying this, man, uh, I was like, wow, this is a lot. So this may not be like, it may be a part two to this. Let's just say that. Um, so before we begin, let's go to the word. Luke chapter 8, we're going to read verses 4 through 15. And the Bible says this. And when a great multitude had gathered, they had come to him from every city. He spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on the good ground, it sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? He's talking about Jesus. And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries. Some uh, illustrations it says mysteries. I'm sorry, it says uh, secrets. To you to know the, the, the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and take away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of this life, and bring on no fruit of maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, Having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is a lamp and a light unto our feet, God. I thank you that your word has power, sharper than any two-edged sword, Father. We pray, Lord God, tonight that I would decrease, you would increase, God, that your message would be delivered, and that your name would be glorified, Father. I pray that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Luke chapter 8. We're going to be talking about uh, a parable. So the Apostle Luke's account of Jesus speaking to this large crowd uh, is also recorded in the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic Gospels specifically, Matthew and Mark. Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 23, and also Mark 4, 1 through 20. So if anybody want to check that out in your personal time, you can go and look at what we're reading tonight, uh, then the Synoptic Gospels, and see what each person is saying. Now this parable, the parable of the sower, is often regarded as the first parable that Jesus ever taught. This is because the account of Jesus teaching, teaching it in the book of Mark. The book of Mark is the oldest of the Synoptic Gospels, and is believed to be written down from oral tradition between 65 and 75 A.D., so this is like the first uh, installment, as though it were, of Jesus teaching in parables. Now, wh what is a parable? Anybody ever read the parables or read a few parables in the Bible? By a show of hands. You, you read some parables? Y'all like parables? Yeah, I think they're pretty good, too, as long as I can understand them. So what is a parable? So a parable, I looked at many definitions, uh, different Bible dictionaries and different things, and just from reading and studying and asking the Lord, I have my own little definition, then we're going to give the definition that uh, 
uh, Tony Evans, like the Tony Evans gives. So here's what I have. From my study, a parable is a short, simple story that teaches a spiritual concept or a kingdom idea, often using everyday life scenarios. All right, so it's like a simple story, a simple illustration that usually refers to or teaches us something about something that's much larger, something that's deeper, uh, and that deeper thing being something spiritual. So Tony Evans explains it this way. He says, Jesus' parables were earthly stories with heavenly meanings. Jesus took ordinary, everyday people or activities, put them into stories format, a stories format, and taught his listeners a valuable kingdom principle that used the familiar to explain the unfamiliar. I thought that was awesome. Use the familiar, the everyday, something that you experience every day to explain something that is unfamiliar, uh, a kingdom concept, something that is spiritual. Use something natural to help us understand something that is spiritual. I love that. I think that's very wise. Jesus has a way of, uh, like we would say, Jesus got a mouthpiece. He got away with his words, man. He's just, he just cold, man. Like. So we're going to look at verse 4, going to our first point real quick. Verse 4 says, And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. Most people, I've, I've checked out a few sermons. Most sermons and most pastors kind of skip over uh, this first verse. They kind of go straight into the parables and start talking about the soils and this, that, and the third. And that's awesome. But what I felt the Lord impressing upon me is a great multitude. He had me dwell on a great multitude. At the inception of this parable encounter, we see Jesus speaking to a large crowd or a great multitude. That's what a great multitude is, a large crowd. How many people? We don't know, but it was a lot. And I'm going to explain how we know that. Because in Mark chapter 4, verse 1, it tells us that the crowd was so big that Jesus got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. So we don't get that from Luke. But in Mark, it tells us a little bit more about what's going on. Jesus seen this big crowd, and he was like, okay, I got something for y'all. He got in a boat. It must have been a big boat. As Minister Phil talk about it, it's a big old commercial boat that got a lot of fish in it, right? It can catch a lot of fish. So he was in the big boat, and then he can, he can turn and see the entire crowd, see all the people, and see exactly you know, the full crowd. It's, it's like me if we got a full house in here. If I'm on the ground level, I can't really see the people in the back. So Jesus kind of got in a place where he can really look upon the whole crowd and see all the souls that were there on the shore. So the multitude of people represents a few things. Number one, it represents how far and wide the word of God is to reach in the earth. How far and how wide the word of God is to reach in the earth. Verse 4 tells us this. They come to him from every city. From just his hometown? No, from every city. Every city. And that is the visionary path for the gospel of Jesus Christ to reach, to reach into every city. I would dare to believe in Lafayette, the gospel, or some church that went out and, and teach the word of God to every hood. Right? So just 10x that. The word of God is to go out into every city. Every city, every state, Every country, every island, even the most remote areas. Just before his ascension, Jesus tells his disciples in Acts 1.8, he says this, you shall receive power. When I leave, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I'm going, but I'm going to send my help. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And you shall be a witness to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of of the earth. Where? Everywhere. The end of the earth. There's not an area on this uh, planet, if you want to call it that. And I thought it was kind of interesting when I read that it said to the end of the earth. Now, a, a, a ball don't have an end. It's kind of making me think about that. You know what I'm saying? So, the end of the earth, the remote corners, there's not an area that the word of God the truth of Jesus Christ will not reach. Quite literally, the words of Jesus was and still is purposed to reach every city, every state, every country, every nation. 
Also, this great multitude symbolizes all of mankind. So when he looked upon this, uh, all the people, you can see how wide, how deep, right? That can represent or represents how far the word of God is to reach. But it also symbolizes all of mankind, all of whom that Jesus died for. For God so loved the world, the world being the inhabitants of the earth, men, women, and children. God loved the inhabitants of the earth so much that he gave his only, his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not die, but have eternal life. In other words, that very group of people that he was speaking the parable to are the ones that he was preparing to give his life for. He wanted to get an elevated uh, view so he can see even the person in the, in the corner trying to hide, yeah, I'm about to die for you. I want to see you. I, I know you from your mother's womb. I know what you're going through at this time. So the work that I'm about to complete has been prophesied, and we're going to talk about it. Since Isaiah, I'm about to complete this work, and I'm about to complete it for you. That truism remains today. As we embark upon this study of the parable of the sower, this multitude that is before me tonight, all of us, and of whom I am also a member of, is whom Christ died for. It's at this point in time that all the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah, that Jesus, were being about Jesus, was being fulfilled. Specifically, Isaiah's prophecy were literally about to be fulfilled. What did Isaiah say? Well, in 53.7 of the book of Isaiah, he says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace, brought us peace, and now we have access to those promises of healing, of salvation that we, we just prayed about. He brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed, Amen. completely healed. So let's go back to where we are. Jesus is in the boat, and all this is before him. He knows what is to come. He, know the cro he knows that the cross is before him. And he knows every soul that is before him. He knows what he's up against. He knows what he's entering into, and he's not backing down. Isaiah 53, 9 says it as well. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. He was going to hang on a cross next to two criminals and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence nor any deceit in his mouth, that was all to come. Yes, the large crowd, the multitude was before him, but also the fulfillment of the scriptures, the fulfillment of the prophecies was approaching. The very act of the gospel was before him. As we study, we're going to talk about the seed and, and kind of give you a little spoiler, but you already know, you read the parable. The seed is the word of God or the good news, right? And as we look at Jesus, he's preparing, like I just said, to actually... Um, Complete, I kind of struggle with how to, how to phrase this, complete the, the work that was the good news. Like the gospel wasn't complete yet, right? He was entering into that, that, uh, that season in his life to, you know, to suffer and die for our sins. So it's like the, the gospel, it was like, how can I say this? The way the Lord kind of gave me is like, it's like a play. There's rehearsal and you prepare for a play and you prepare, and you prepare, and you prepare. And that's what Jesus was. The prophecies came. Isaiah spoke. Jesus was born of the virgin. Some of the prophecies was completed, right, fulfilled. Um, Jesus taught in the synagogues. I mean, so much was going on. Jesus was being prepared. He was practicing and preparing for the big play, right, for the big play. And the big play being him to suffer and die on the cross for our sins, right, to be buried in the grave and on the third day to raise, to be, you know, to be resurrected, to conquer death and conquer sin. That was the big play. That was, the, that was, was what, come, what was coming up. So we're right before that. So what exactly is the good news? What is, what is all this? I kind of just explained it, but Romans, anybody heard of the Romans road to salvation? It gives us a, a good understanding of what was before him. 
I have a little illustration. I don't know if they'll put it on the, on the screen. But Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short, or have come short of God's glorious standard. We've all sinned. There's none righteous, no, not one. We all are sinners by nature and by choice. By way of original sin, we've all sinned in Adam. By choice, we've all committed some sinful act. In other words, when God said don't, we've all did it. When God said don't touch, we all did what? We touched. When God said stay, we all left. At some point, it looks different in everybody's walk. When God said go, we said, nah, God, I like it right here. We've all sinned. It's funny how the good news start bad. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Yeah, we've all sinned, and we all got to pay for that sin. And the wages, the penalty, the payment for sin is death, a physical death and a spiritual death, that being separation from the one true and living God, the maker of your soul. Sin can't dwell in the presence of a holy God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love, his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I like to think of it this way. While you were sinning, Christ died. Like while you were in the act of whatever sin you shameful, you too shameful to acknowledge in a public setting, when you was committing that sin, Christ died at that time. Romans 5, 8. Romans 10, 9 through 10. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, not you might, but you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and you are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. The good news. You was broken, busted, can't be trusted. You was on your way to hell. But Christ died. And if we believe by faith in our hearts, he's faithful and just to save us and deliver us from that penalty that we so deserve. Romans 10, 13, for whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That tells us exactly who this good news is for. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We all have access. I like access. You ever been in a room where you felt like, man, I don't, I'm not supposed to be here. That's not, we don't, that's not the gospel. We all have access. We all have entrance into this room. That's the good news. And that's what was before Jesus as he was in that boat looking at the great multitude, the, the large crowd. So point number one. There we go. The great multitude. Now let's look at point number two. Still sticking with the same scripture here in verse four. And when a great multitude had gathered, I'm sorry, verse five. They had come to him from every city. He spoke by a parable. Verse 5, a sower went out to sow. Before we even get any further, we got to identify what is a sower. Not somebody that would uh, that would take in a jacket. Uh, you know what I'm saying? A, a seamstress. You know what I'm saying when we talk about a sower. No, 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 no. A sower. Often these parables included everyday tasks such as working. Besides, the Hebrews were well acquainted with, the, with work. So someone who was a sower, you can equate that to someone who is a farmer. Um, as a people, we were skilled laborers and diligent in our work as instructed by God. Examples include God instructing Adam in the Garden of Eden to till it, to till the garden, and to keep it. In other words, this, this, this profession, this job, this duty of being a sower was something that the people of God, Hebrews, was very acquainted with. 
because Adam was a sower. He was to till the land in the garden. He was to keep it, right? Psalm 90, which is titled A Prayer of Moses, is believed to be a prayer prayed by Moses while in the wilderness. And it's Psalm 90, 17, and it says this, Let the beauty of the Lord, our God, be upon us, and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Someone who was a sower, a farmer, was a profession. It was a, the, the established work of our hands. And from the time of Abraham to the time of the early church spans a period of about 2,000 years, and how people made a living varied depending on when and where they lived. And being a farmer was one of those professions, very common professions. And remember, when we started this, uh, this lesson tonight, we, we said what a parable was a simple story about everyday things that explained something that was, that was deep spiritually. So farming was a very common profession, a very common job. So a sower was not common, was not uncommon um, to be something that they dealt with on a daily basis. In fact, some people in the large crowd might have been farmers. Other professions include shepherds. Closer to the time of Jesus, shepherd also lived in near villages. Sometimes a shepherd was hired by a landowner to oversee the owner's flock. And when food supplies got scarce near the villages, shepherds would move, to the, move their herds to mountain pastures and in, in the hot summer or to warmer valleys in the winter. For example, David was a shepherd boy. Remember when they went to find David? Where was he? He was in the field, tending to the flock, fighting off bears and lions. Also, Abel was also a shepherd. So again, these parables often uh, referred to everyday things, professions, uh, daily duties, daily work, okay? This reminds me of another parable, parable of the lost sheep. When it refers to a shepherd, everyone could relate. Also fishermen, and again farmers. When the Israelites finally settled in Canaan, after leaving their life of slavery in Egypt, followed by the wilderness period, and then years of battling the Canaanites, Israel settled in the promised land. Joshua divided the land amongst the tribes, beginning in Joshua 13. And at this time, farming became an important way of making a living for the Israelites, right? Uh, grains such as wheat and barley were used to make bread and were the most important crop. Grains as well as lentils and peas are known to have been cultivated uh, in that area. For example, in the Old Testament, Cain was also a farmer. So the point is, seeing a sower as an example or hearing a, a story about a sower wasn't something that they couldn't relate to. In fact, it was something that they really could relate to. So the Greek word for sower is uh, spero. Kind of, kind of roll the R. I don't want to, I'm not good at that. And it means to sow, to scatter seed. And the sower here in this parable, quite initially, is Jesus. Luke 8, 1. He went through every city. So Luke 8, 1 is, is actually before we started reading, right? The, the beginning of the chapter. And it tells us exactly what Jesus was doing before he gets to the, um, the sea and he starts to have this multitude of people crowd him. And he, then he uh, actually says the parable or speaks the parable. In verse 1, it says, he went through every city and village preaching and bringing glad tidings of the kingdom of God. The parable he was about to speak in a spiritual context, he was already doing at the beginning of the chapter. He was going through every city and every village, preaching and bringing glad tidings. He was sowing seeds of the kingdom. Now the sower also represents the servant or the servants of God. Yes, the pastor or the minister who's been assigned to deliver God's message to his people during a corporate church setting like this, or maybe on Sundays, or maybe uh, on Sunday service for um, discipleship training, but also during collaborative evangelical settings. For example, Rock the Block, Feed the Block, Nursing Home Ministry, Community Outreach, and so forth. So that coming together, that collaborative effort of the people of God, of the church, 
to sow seeds, together, combined, we serve as a sower. In Ephesians, Paul said, in verse 11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, to sow seeds of the kingdom of God, to edify the body of Christ, and to do the work of the ministry. Till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. So sowing was something that was very uh, relevant at the time of this, uh, at the time of Jesus giving the parable, but is also very relevant even today. We all serve the role of a sower at some point. This encompasses church leaders, from the pastor to the children's uh, teacher for Sunday school. We can all find ourselves operating in the role of a sower. All of us may be a big brother, big sister, grandmother, grandfather. We all serve the role of the sower. But what about, yeah, what about parents? You said grandparents, aunties, uncles, big brothers, even co-workers. You're somebody's co-worker. You may be somebody's manager. You may own your own business. You may be a supervisor of a department. I don't know about you, but I've been fortunate to have praying parents who sowed seeds in my life, who prayed for me when I was lost, when I was sick and sin who sowed seeds of God's truth in my life even when I was in pursuit of my own desires and my own lust. I have been a sower and I've benefited from sowers. Amen. Even coming to church, probably some 16 years ago, I was blessed um, to have a good pastor. I was getting the word every Tuesday Every Sunday, every Tuesday, and every Sunday, every Tuesday, it was the same guy for probably a decade, Pastor O. And uh, I often think about that, working a full-time job, a family, and teaching on month, Sundays and Tuesdays. Man, that's some work. That's some work. And it's good to reflect on that because it gives me a heart of gratitude. Like, man. You know, that's a blessing. Like, that, that is, that's God. <laughs> that's how I look at it. You know what I'm saying? If I'm ever in, in that position, it's, it's all God. So I give God praise for that. And what about Minister Ant? Hanging out, fellowship with a, with a young guy. Um, he didn't Bible beat me, but he listened to a young brother who was wrestling with God, who was growing in Christ, who was hungry for the things of God, for the word of God. Minister Phil, hosting different events. Uh, the youth rallies, that gave me something to do and something to plug into. I was able to serve. These brothers served. They sold into me. And I give God prayer. I thank y'all. The truth is that, that we all wrestle with God no matter where, we, where you are in your walk with God. We all wrestle. We all growing to some degree, no matter if you've been in Christ 30 years. And I can say that with confidence because the word tells us that we go from glory to glory. That don't stop until you get to glory. So we all wrestle with God, and no matter where you are in your walk with God, remember that you have been entrusted with seeds of the kingdom to sow both locally and abroad. No matter where you are, you can be sowing a seed into somebody's life. My older silver saints, you've gone through a lot of different things. You've experienced so much, and that richness of experience is a very bag, a, a big bag of seeds that you could be sowing. Even those who may be going through something, uh, maybe you've been in Christ a year, and you just got the, your first testimony, and that first testimony can be something that you sow into somebody else who's coming up behind you, who's hungry like you are. So we talked about the multitude, we talked about the sower. We all play the role of the sower. We all should. The Great Commission. We should all be looking out to see who uh, may be in need. And we all benefit from someone being a sower in our lives. 
Looking at point number three, we're going to talk about his seed. His seed. Staying in verse five, a sower went out to sow what? His seed. Went out to sow his seed. Quite frankly, the seed is the word of God. And Jesus said it in Luke 8, 1. <clears throat> we'll get to it. Maybe not tonight. Maybe next time I'm here. But in verse 11, it says, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Luke 8, 11. Few things here. Number one is that, number one being the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what the seed is, right? It's the gospel. It's very specific. You know, if you're looking to sow something, you're looking to, to share something about God with somebody, share the gospel. And we just looked at it, right? That we all sinners. Christ died a sacrificial, atoning death for our sins. You believe on his death. In return, he'll take his righteousness and clothe you with it. Um, and by that, his righteousness clothed you. And when God looks at you, he doesn't see your filth anymore. He sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus. In other words, you become redeemed. He redeems you. Number two, it represents the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminated word of God. This is the whole counsel of God. This is uh, the, the whole book, not just the gospel, but the whole book. From Genesis to Revelations. For example, if a brother is coming to me for godly counsel about, about a matter, um, maybe it's a, I don't know, a health-related matter, you know, I'm not going to just give him the gospel. That's out of context. I may share to him the scriptures that speak to me, that I, I, I meditate on, that helps me live a healthy life. Make sense? So the, the seed that I sowed now becomes the word of God outside of the gospel, but still the word of God. In other words, it's still his seed. So if a brother is coming to me for a godly counsel on a matter, it is necessary to give him the word, the word of God, his seed, and what God says about it, and not my opinion. Not what I think. Not what I can, what feel good to say at the moment. For example, if I go to Brother Cornelius, I'm going to use uh, biblical names, right? And I say, Brother Cornelius, me and my wife, man, we're not getting along. That's not the truth. <laughs> we always disagreeing about money. She don't want to eat what I cook. When she wash clothes, she wash everybody's clothes but mine. It's not looking good, Brother Cornelius. I don't know what's going on. Now, Brother Cornelius is in the church. What did Brother Cornelius say something like? Well, you know what they say. No woman, no cry. You're doing all that crying. You might have to turn her loose. Now, hold up, Brother Cornelius. I'm looking for godly counsel. I'm looking for the word of God. I'm looking for the truth. I come to you with an issue. I'm looking for godly counsel. All right? That's not what the words say, Brother Cornelius. He might say something like, yeah, you're right. It's cheaper to keep. <laughs> I go to Brother Cornelius for godly counsel, and I leave with confusion and a migraine headache. <laughs> What's your point, bro? Uh, don't be Brother Cornelius. If somebody coming to you with some issues or something and you don't know what to say and just say, I don't know. I don't, don't, don't make something up. Don't be a brother Cornelius. Sow the seed of God's word and not some back alley false wisdom. Not your own opinion. Not some stuff you heard your grandfather say that's going to sound good at the time. If you go sow a seed, sow his word. Sow the word of God. Number three, it's God's seed that we're sowing. I kind of been saying it here. Again, it's not your seed, not your opinion. It's his seed, not selfish ambition, not hidden motives, not your own opinion. 
I'm reminded of Acts 8.18 when Simon tried to buy the transferring of the Holy Spirit. Y'all remember that? Simon said, man, that look, I like that. I think I might be able to make some money on that. I might be able to capitalize on this opportunity. That's not how you do it. That's not how you do it. If, if, if Simon liked what he saw, he could have asked, uh, I believe it was Paul, he could have asked, oh, it was Peter, what was going on? And ask some questions, be inquisitive, not try to buy it. And by being inquisitive, he could have seed sown into him. He could have been edified, he could have been built up. Simon wanted to buy the power of the Holy Spirit and monetize it on the open market for his own personal gain. That's not how it works. God's seed is not for sale. God's seed is not for sale. A seed has everything it needs to begin a new life. Let's talk about a little um, plant anatomy. Inside the seed, inside specifically the seed coat, is an embryonic or a baby plant composed of an embryonic or embryonic root, stem, and leaves. In addition, the seed contains its own food supply. Anybody know what that's called? It's called endosperm. And it's packed with nutrients to keep the seed nourished and allow it to grow. Okay? And we're going to talk about the different environments that uh, a seed is planted into that helps it to grow. But when a seed is planted, it has everything it needs to grow, to sprout, to produce a harvest. In the same manner, God's word is complete. It's lacking nothing. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will endure forever. And his promises within it will last, will endure forever. It's an enduring word. It endured the many times we rejected it. Anybody ever rejected the word of God or rejected some seed sown in your life? Somebody want to tell you about Jesus and you didn't really want to hear it? Or it just wasn't that your time or whatever that is? You wasn't ready? However we explain it? Didn't it endure? Didn't maybe months or years later, whenever it was sown in your life, you did receive it and it did bear fruit? It's an enduring word. Again, how many people can recall the time in your life when God's when God's word didn't carry weight in your life. And now it does. God's word is complete. God's word has power. Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of, his, of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, unto the Hebrew first and also the Gentile. And this good news, this seed, tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished through the, from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. God's word, God's seed, is complete, like in nothing. It has everything it's need, it needs to accomplish its work in your life, for salvation, for healing, for deliverance, for leadership in your life, for decision-making, it is complete, lacking nothing. And that's the seed. Now let's get into the soil. Get in, into the soil. We talked about the great multitude. We talked about the sower. We talked about the seed. Now let's talk about the soil. The soil in this parable represents the hearts of men. Specifically, the condition of the hearts of men. There are four varying types of soil. Stated another way, there are four different conditions that the seed of God's word can be sown into. There are four different conditions of the men, the hearts of men. When I say men, I mean mankind. That encompasses men and women. I think it's noteworthy to point out the fact that is the soil that is the only varying thing, the only thing that is changing, the only thing that has a, a, a difference between the, the four. 
It is the only varying or changing component in this parable. Okay? The multitude is the multitude. The sower is the sower. And the seed is the seed. It's complete. The sower will always be the sower. The seed is the infallible, unchangeable word of God. The condition of the soil, the condition of our hearts, is what varies. Now, before we actually talk about the different uh, conditions of the soil, I kind of want to preface and, and uh, prepare our perspectives before we, we go into it. So bef before we study the different types of soils, prepare your perspective, meaning instead of categorizing yourself as a different or a particular type of soil, approach this parable as a challenge for yourself with God's help to identify the condition of your heart, the condition of your soil right now. Secondly, begin to cultivate the soil with your, I'm sorry, cultivate the soil of your heart so that the good word of God has the best effect in your life. Now let me rephrase that. When we approach these scriptures, again, don't identify, try to self-identify, oh, I'm this soil, I'm the good soil, I'm, I'm here, I'm there. But instead, look within and uh, self-reflect, rather, and identify where are you right now. What's the condition of your heart in this season? In this season. Secondly, be thinking of and be open to the Holy Spirit leading you on wisdom and ways of how to cultivate the soil of your heart, so that God's seed, his infallible, complete seed, his word, can has the, have the best effect in your life. All right? Everybody prepared? The wayside soil. Let's read the scriptures, then we'll get into the explanation. We're going to jump real quick to um, the... Second part of the verses that we've read, starting in verse 11, where Jesus actually gives the explanation of the parables. It says in verse 11, now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God, which we spoke of. Verse 12, where we want to be. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. When the devil comes, then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved. Let's talk about the wayside soil. The wayside was the travel path. Okay? Different um, translations, they won't say the, the uh, wayside, they'll say, uh, I believe it says travel path. The NOT says something different. Anybody got an NOT in here? What do you say, man? The wayside was the travel path, the footpath. Thank you, love. The wayside was the travel path, the footpath, the place where everybody stepped on. And in the field, it was very particular. Everybody knew what a footpath was because that was the beaten path. They may have grass everywhere, but on the beaten path, on the wayside, on the footpath, it might have been narrow, but it was no grass. It was just dirt, and it was hard. Everywhere else was soft, but the wayside was hard. Anybody used to go walk to the store and you cut through an old field? Y'all saw the footpath? Y'all know what the footpath was? It was very obvious, right? And the footpath was the footpath once again because everyone was walking on the footpath. The wayside was the travel path. It was where everyone walked so that they wouldn't walk on the tilled land where the furrows were. The furrows is where the tilled land was and the ground was open. That way seed can fall into it. The wayside or the footpath was hardened because of all the traffic, all the tramping, trampling along that path. Children skipping along the path, donkeys walking on the path, 
men and women walking on the path. Probably had a walking stick. The soil on the wayside was so hard that the seed could not penetrate the soil. The seed could not penetrate the wayside soil. This is true concerning even the hearts of men. The hearts of men can also become hardened from being walked on, from being used, from being abused, being trampled on, sometimes by the people who should love you the most, being cast away. The, the footpath was only good for being the footpath, being stepped on, walked on, a route to get from one place to another. Our hearts can become hardened from being used. But also the hearts of men can also become hardened from other things. Other things that may come from within. Things that can harden our hearts from within are things like bitterness, things like unforgiveness. Doesn't matter if you were wronged by no fault of your own. Unforgiveness is unforgiveness, and it'll still harden your heart. The unwillingness to forgive produces calluses on our hearts. Other things that harden our hearts from within would be jealousy, envy. For example, being jealous, that you, being so jealous that you can't be happy for the person being blessed next to you. Tend to your soil by praying a prayer of thanksgiving for someone who's being blessed near you. Tend to your soil by way of forgiveness. Tend to your soil by way of self-reflection. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, consider yourself. What is the condition of your heart tonight? The wayside soil or the hard heart, hears the word of God, <coughs> excuse me, but does not respond to it. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, <clears throat> I was going to take my time on that. <clears throat> Woo. All right. <clears throat> Voice didn't change on me. The devil won't win. <laughs> Sure is. It's all good. If I sound weird, it's in Jesus' name. <clears throat> the wayside soil or the hard heart hears the word, but it does not respond to it <clears throat> because the hardness <clears throat> of the soil. The hardness of the soil. How hard is your heart tonight? <clears throat> Going back to the beginning of the parable, when Jesus looked out upon the crowd, 
every type of soil was in that crowd. Jesus wanted to see <clears throat> who was in the crowd and specifically the conditions of their heart. Because the work that he was about to complete, he wanted to see who was going to receive it. Whose heart it would penetrate. He wasn't doing this work in vain. <clears throat> By way of election, we know he was doing this for a reason, for a purpose. He was doing it for you. <clears throat> now tonight we'll only cover one heart, one soil type. <clears throat> the condition of... <coughs> the condition of one type of heart. But I think it's enough. It's enough for us to consider ourselves, to look within. <clears throat> Again, we preface this as we got into this, not to look at these type of hearts and initially write it off. Oh, that's not me, I'm saved. Yeah, in the context of this, it says that <clears throat> the soil on the, on the wayside, it represents those who heard the word of God, but it didn't penetrate their hearts. They didn't believe it. They didn't receive it. But they heard it. They heard it. And that's the gospel. <clears throat> and there's some who come to church every Tuesday, every Sunday, and they hear it, but they had not responded. <clears throat> and, and it's important that if that's you, you have an opportunity to believe on the night. But if I can speak to, the, to everybody else, we all included in this to self-reflect. There may be a word that God is speaking to you right now. It may not be the gospel. You receive that. But it's something that God is telling you to do. It's Bible. But your heart is hard towards it. The condition of your heart, the truth, the, the, the prophecy, the provision, or whatever it is that he's speaking, the leadership he's providing to you at this moment, in this season, the condition of your heart that seed can't penetrate. So it's important to look within. It's important to inspect yourself and not just jump over the wayside hard heart soil. Maybe your heart isn't hard in your marriage. Your heart is, your heart is hard on your job. <clears throat> you ain't said it, but you hate your boss. Or you hate your coworker. And you're a believer. You got strong feelings, right? God may be using that, that opportunity, that situation, that circumstance to minister to you, to sow a seed into you. But you're using those circumstances. <clears throat> you're receiving them, and it's hardening your heart. The wayside soil, or the hard heart, hears the word, but does not respond to it because of the hardness of the heart, the hardness of the soil. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, and we give you praise. We thank you for who you are. You're a living God. You're the one true living God. I thank you, Lord God, for healing and restoration, <clears throat> no matter what it looked like. I thank you, Father, for ministering to us on tonight, God. And by way of your spirit, we can all, God, look at every type of soil, every, the condition of every type of heart, God, and see ourselves at some point. God, we've all been in the place of the wayside soil at some point. We've all been trampled on. We've all been used, cast away. But I thank you so much that you sent your son Jesus to redeem us. That even while our hearts were hard, Christ died. He died for sinners. Of whom we all are. 
some redeemed, some being redeemed. So I thank you that tonight we have an opportunity to respond to your seed, respond to your word. And as we pray, even tonight, I feel led, if you want to respond to the word of God, whether it's the gospel, as you heard in the message tonight, or whether it be <clears throat> you want to respond to something that God has been speaking to you, believer, but you've been ignoring and hardening your heart. If you want to respond, every head bow, every eye closed. If you want to respond, just raise up your hand. Just, just, just tell God you want to respond tonight. If that's you, just raise your hand. Just let him know. A physical illustration of what it is you need. God, we're your people, and your people communicate with you. I thank you that that door is open. You can put your hands down if you hadn't already. <clears throat> if you want to respond to God's seed, number one being the gospel, I'm going to say it again, understand that we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of God's glory. It's none righteous, no, not one. While you were sinning, while we were sinning, Christ died. A sacrificial, atoning death for our sins. The soul that sin must die, God said, I got you. Jesus, <clears throat> die in their place. Die for them. And when they believe on you, I'm going to clothe them with the righteousness, that perfect life that you lived. I'm going to clothe them with it. I look at them, I don't want to see what they did, but I want to see and I will see what you did, Jesus. Your righteousness. That's clean, shining. It's beautiful. And I'm going to give them my spirit that's going to lead and guide them in all things. Pray, if you're in that category, just believe. I don't have to pull your toes. And for others, it may be a spiritual truth, something that God is leading you in. I don't know what you do. Something you've been wrestling with. And you've been hardening your heart. <clears throat> if you fall in any of those categories, let's pray. You can stand. We will be dismissed after that. You can stand. <clears throat> Repeat after me. Say, God, uh, I, admit I admit that I am a sinner. That I am a sinner. I've, done wrong. I've done wrong, whether I acknowledge it, whether I acknowledge it or, not. or not. I choose to, I choose to confess, confess with my heart, with my heart. Through, my mouth, through my mouth that I have sinned against you. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry. I apply my faith, apply my faith. On, the, on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I believe that his sacrifice is my payment. Is my payment. Now, I say with confidence now I say with confidence that Jesus is my Lord, that Jesus is my Lord. And, I am and I am redeemed. In Jesus' name. Let's continue on that second group. Repeat after me. Most high, God, Most high God, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for saving me. And I confess, and I confess that, I've still done wrong, that I've still done wrong. Even in my deliverance. Even in my deliverance. I've hardened my heart. I've, hardened my heart. I've, not, listened. I've not listened. And tonight I tell you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Fertilize my heart. Fertilize my heart. In, fact, renew it. in fact, renew it. You say in your word, say in your word that, a that a broken and a contrite heart, a contrite heart you, will not refuse. you will not refuse. 
Don't refuse me here tonight. Make me over and lead me in the things, in the thing that I've been hardening my heart against. I trust you and I believe you. In Jesus' name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. Give God some praise. Hallelujah. Thank y'all for coming out. Let's pray a blessing, a benediction on the way out, Father. We thank you and we give you praise for your people coming out tonight, God. I thank you for healing us. I thank you for speaking to us, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. Bless them in their week. I pray, Lord God, that you would keep them and lead them, that you would guide them, and bring us here safely on Sunday, God. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.